identify five people before you take a seat. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <coughs> Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> so good, so good. Hey man, thanks for my large coffee, bro. You're a, you're a real Christian. First row seat in heaven. <laughs> so good, so good. Well, well, well. Hey, guys, I want to welcome you to church. Oh, hey, guys, welcome back. Welcome back. Um, I also want to welcome our new families, any new guests. I want to just sincerely say welcome to the family. And I hope as well, just welcome home. Um, you know, that's what we pray, that everybody that walks through those doors feels a part of a family and feels like, you know what, this feels like home. So I just want to sincerely say welcome to the family and welcome home. Hey, guys, can we give our guests and our new families a round of applause, please? <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, good morning, church. It's good to be back. My wife let me go away to Melbourne for five days. She had both the kids. She is extraordinary. Uh, she let me go and uh, watch the footy, the Anzac Day game, Collingwood against Essendon. The Pies won. Thank you, Jesus. There is a God. No, but um, I've, I've just recently got into footy. Um, the last year's grand final se uh, season series was, was awesome, and, and now I'm just hooked. So uh, my father-in-law took me away to Melbourne. Uh, it was a part of my Christmas present, and I had just the best time. Um, but... The Ajay household is definitely in holiday mode. We feel quite quite checked out, <laughs> quite tired. This is the time where we take our holidays. We go hard through Christmas and New Year's, and then we take some time off just for ourselves and also to seek God for the new year. I say that because in a week's time, we go away to Queensland for two weeks. We go to our pastors and leaders conference where we will be seeking God for what does he want to do for the future of this church. Uh, please just keep us in your prayers as we just seek God for that. Uh, and we're also going to have some time to ourselves. So sorry if I haven't gotten to you in these last couple of weeks. Sorry if I haven't answered calls or messages. I've got this terrible habit of replying mentally and not pushing send. And then I go back to, man, why haven't they replied? And I haven't even sent the message. It's just typed up in the box. So my apologies. But anyway, um, so that's what's happening with the Ajay. So keep us in your prayers, please. Um, but thank you for releasing us and thank you for letting us do what we need to do. I want to speak to you briefly from this thought. You've got the wrong one. You've got the wrong one. These have been my thoughts lately. These have been my words lately. I know you probably don't want to hear your pastor say that, but you know, we're, we're human and there are times where we just don't feel like we're enough. And I want to speak into that place of, God, I think you've got the wrong one. And I wonder if you've ever felt that way. I wonder if you've ever felt, God, you've got the wrong one. You feel ill-equipped for the task ahead, you feel unqualified for the call on your life. Maybe you feel unworthy to receive the things God wants to give you or even to hold on to the things that God has given you. I wonder, have you felt that way? And if your answer is no to any of those things, well, I just want to uh, say, I'm um, so welcome, Jesus. Uh, you can come up and take the mic. <laughs> but we've all felt like that at some point. And I, I don't know why, but it's just been ringing in my head to preach into this. And I'm just going to share some scriptures with you. I want to speak into that place of, of insecurity that might think, God, are you sure? <laughs> God, are you sure you've got the right one? The crazy thing is you could have the dream everything. The dream spouse, the dream job, the dream kids, the dream role, the dream whatever. But you can still feel like, oh, God, you've got the wrong one. This mindset, if, less, if left unchecked, is a destiny killer. It's a, it's, it's a dream quencher. It suffocates your gifts and your talents. And it's very important that we learn how to combat this mindset of feeling unworthy or feeling not quite good enough. When I'm feeling the weight of life, you know, my wife is so great. She just knows how to read me. She knows me better than anyone. She will see it and she'll just come and give me a hug. And the hug says it all. The hug just says, I see you. You don't have to talk. It's all good, but I love you. And just in that hug, the recipient of that hug, you just feel this breath of, 
it's okay. And I just feel like God wants to hug that place of insecurity this morning. I just feel like he just wants to do that with you. He just wants to lift your head and say, it's all good. You are more than enough. You are so worthy that a king would die for you. You are so worthy that I stepped out of eternity and entered time for you. Don't pay attention to the lies of your flesh or the lies of the enemy. You are enough. And if your king says that you are enough, then who are we to say we're not? But that's what I believe this morning. He wants to step into that place and just hug that place of insecurity. Romans 12.2. So we need to go to the place of insecurity. Romans 12.2 says this. You've heard it before. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. When you are doubting your self-worth, when you are doubting who you are, it's a very hard place to think clearly from. The battle is for this right here. And it is so important that we know how to, all right, God, I need the truth on the matter. I need the truth about who I am. I need you to speak to me on who I am. So where do we go for the truth? To the word of God. And, if he, and he says, if you plug into this, your mind will be renewed so that you can discern the truth about whatever's going on in your life and discern the truth about who you are. Romans 10, 17 takes this deeper. So as we read the word, it renews our mind by the feeding of our faith. When your insecurity, sorry, when your insecurity rises to the surface, it has quite a few faces. It can manifest itself as fear, can manifest itself as stress, can manifest itself as anger, but it's all rooted in insecurity. Insecurity brings a lot of doubt, brings a lot of instability, and so we need to learn how to be stable in this place. And how we fight insecurity is by our faith. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The feeding of our faith is important because faith combats the doubts, it, which could manifest itself in all those different ways. But it's through reading the word. It's through building my faith. In Ephesians 6, it says, Above all, so above all else, lift up your shield of faith to quench the fiery darts that come your way. What are the fiery darts? The doubts, the temptations, the distractions that the enemy wants to hurl your way to get you um, on an off track. And so it says to lift up the shield of faith above all else. So if you're going through some doubts about who you are, maybe doubts about what God wants to do in your life, lift up your faith. And like I said at the start, I can't lift that shield for you. You've got to lift up your faith. All right, look, all right, John, well, how do I get faith? Well, you've got to read the word. You've got to strengthen your faith through the word. And by doing so, your mind will be renewed. When we refer to mind and heart, they, they sort of go hand in hand. The heart and mind, I like to see it, are, are like the control centers in us. What we receive, what we process, what we distribute comes through the filter of our mind and heart. And so Proverbs 4.23, which talks about the heart, but we can apply it to the mind too, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. I want to take this deeper. You can tell where someone's heart is at by how they speak. You can tell where someone's faith is by what comes out of their mouth. You can tell where someone's at by what they say. I can tell what's in your heart by how you talk. I can tell where your faith is by how you talk. You can lie to me, talk a big game, but behind all of that, you can discern what's going on in the heart. The point I'm trying to make is what's in here will come out. What's in here will be spoken of. And so when we're talking about this self-talk and God, you've got the wrong one, it's important we go to the root. We've got to have a heart check. What's going on in here? What do we believe about us? What strongholds need to be brought down in my heart and in my mind? Look what Proverbs 20, uh, 27, 19 says. As in water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. What's in here comes out. And many times when we're 
speaking over ourself or speaking over our life, something that's contrary to God, it runs deep. And we've got to check this and we've got to keep this in tune with Him. If you want to fix what comes out of you, you've got to fix the heart. Look at what James 3, 3 to 8 says. Take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is when a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Wow. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full, full of deadly poison. Your life is moving in the greatest direction of your strongest confession. I'm going to say it again. Your life is moving in the direction of your strongest confession. What is your confession of yourself? When you look in the mirror, what do you say about yourself? When you're looking at your situation, your circumstance, what do you say about it? Remember, we are made in the image and likeness of our God, right? So when he created creation, it says through wisdom and understanding. So in, internally, in his heart and in his mind, he perceived this idea of what he wanted to create. But then what happened? Then he spoke it. And what he spoke came into existence. So we too are made in his image and his likeness. What we perceive in here and here becomes a reality when we speak it. And it's so important that we learn how to fix our speech. It's so important that we learn how to use this weapon, the sword of the Spirit. We learn how to use this weapon and speak to things. Speak to the atmosphere. Speak to your circumstances. Speak to your situations. Declare the Word of God over it. Speak over yourselves. Proverbs 18.21 The tongue has the power of life and death. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Are you eating fruits of the good things you're confessing? Or are you eating the fruits of the wrong things you're confessing? I want to take this deeper. When Moses is, uh, sent, when he sends the 12 spies to go scout out the land, he gives the spies a command. He says, all right, go and scout out the land. Tell me what you see, right? Tell me what you see. Tell me, is the, is the land plentiful? Uh, in other words... Go and report on the good things. The 12 spies get to the edge of the promised land and they do everything but what they were told to do. They were told to report on the good things, report on how good the land is, what God has done. But two spies come back with the good report, but the 10 spies are like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about this land ahead. There's giants in this land. They are some big dudes and I don't know if we, can, if we can face up to them. They look like Alex who can kick you from two meters away. We do Muay Thai together. Don't, don't, yeah, I'm glad he's on my side. But they look like Alex. No, I'm kidding. He doesn't look mean. Looks great. But there's giants in the land. I don't think this is for us. And this is something very interesting that kind of ties all the scriptures I've just said. What we believe is what we speak. They say, we look like grasshoppers and I think they're going to say, oh, they said we look like grasshoppers or we look like grasshoppers uh, in their eyes, like they've come up and said this. No, they said we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. They're speaking what they're believing. They're speaking what, is, what they're believing in their heart and in their mind. We look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. What was in their heart came out through their mouth. What they believed, they spoke. But what I want you to see about this scene is this. The enemies aren't talking to them. The enemies are far off in the distance. The enemies aren't coming up and taunting to them. They appear big. They appear intimidating. They appear too much. But they haven't said a word. The only word that's been spoken is from God. Go and possess the land. Go and take it. It's, it's in the word. Promised land. All you've got to do is take it. It's a fixed fight. 
It's a sad thing to lose a fixed fight. Oh, that, no, that's just my little antenna. It does a little squeaky thing through the... <laughs> it's a sad thing to lose a fixed fight. But if we're not careful, if we don't fix our perspective, if we don't fix our heart, if we don't fix our speech, we will lose fixed fights in our life. Where God has said, go and take the land. If you're not careful, you will talk yourself out of your promised land. You will talk yourself out of blessings, out of gifts, out of relationships that God has sent to you. But because you say, God, you've got the wrong one. You will talk yourself out of what God's trying to bring you into. We've got to have the right confession of who we are. I want to visit our friend Gideon. In Judges 6, I think we're going to be in Judges 6 probably next week as well. There's just so many good things God is showing me in this book. And as we roll up on Gideon, we're about to see him not in the best state. The people of God have turned from God and they are worshipping other gods and therefore God's like, look, I can't lead you into the promised lands. I can't, I can't do what I want to do. So I'm going to allow your enemies to teach you the lesson that I'm trying to teach you. That's a, that's a hard thing. But I want you to see that that was a choice of the Israelites. And so the people of God have turned away from him. They're no longer thriving, but they're striving. And Gideon's physical position in this story also reveals what he's feeling internally because many times your external atmosphere, your external surroundings reflect your internal surroundings. When you, like, when my room is a mess, I feel a mess. Or sometimes when I'm a mess in here, everything outside of me is a mess. And so Gideon is underground in a wine press threshing wheat. The Israelites are hiding in caves, hiding in the mountains, hiding in the dark areas. They're not living in the light. They are hiding and in this place of survival. And what I want you to see here is this. He is in a wine press, underground, hiding from the enemy. If your self-talk and what you believe about yourself isn't fixed, this too can sometimes reflect how we live. Underneath and not above. Underneath and not on top. We're not operating as the head, we're operating as the tail. Because what I find interesting about the act that he's doing, the threshing of wheat, this was meant to be done on the hilltops. This was meant to be done where all could see. And this act was a beautiful act because it, was, it showed abundance. I'm collecting food. I'm collecting harvest. I'm, I'm free to farm and, 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 and grow my own crops and, and all that stuff. It was something to be done to show, look what God has done for me. I'm blessed. I'm prospering. But he's doing something that should be shown on the hilltops underground. He's hiding his harvest. You ever felt like you needed to hide your blessings? You ever felt like, oh, I can't, I can't show who I really am or I don't want to show that I'm successful or I don't want to drive that car because of what they think. I don't want to wear those clothes because, you know, this tall poppy syndrome. Like, I hate that. I hate that. Because blessings are testimony. Blessings show, look what God has done through me. And then it's a testimony to someone else of look what God can do through you. So we see God is in the wine, oh God, Gideon is in the wine press doing something that should be on the mountaintops. And what is this showing? His witness, his evangelistic tool has been tainted. All because Israel lost sight of who they were. I wonder, are you in the wine press and not on the hilltop? Are you feeling like you were called to be a city on a hill? Don't cover your gifts and talents. Let all see. You know, here's another thing that's a little bit of a pet peeve for me. When you compliment someone and then they, they, they can't take the compliment. It's like, wow, you sing so beautifully. Oh, no, no, I really don't. I suck. What, what do you mean? You, you were so good. Oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't me. It was all God. I, it wasn't that good. But, I mean... <laughs> But oh, it's, it's like, just take the compliment. But here's the thing, to not take the compliment 
is actually to deny the hand of favor on your life. So when someone comes up to me and says, wow, man, you're such a great preacher. I love how you pastor. I love how you preach. Cool, thank you. Receive it because your life is meant to be shining. You're meant to be on the hilltop. And then in my heart, I give glory to God. For those who don't know me, I used to stutter. I still do sometimes. So whenever I'm preaching, I am totally aware of who it is. He took this stuttering boy and made him a preacher. But I don't have to feel the need to appear humble before you. I, I do that in my heart before God. Anyway, all I'm trying to show you is this position that Gideon is in that can sometimes reflect us when we don't have a right view on us. So it's in this place. And I love this. And I, man, if you catch anything from this, catch this point. It's in this low place. It's in this place where Gideon is feeling depressed, feeling like, man, we are underneath. The Midianites and the Amalekites, they've hooked up and they were cruel. What they did was they would go after the women and children first, absolutely um, uh, physically torture the men. And then when it came to the physical fight, they couldn't fight. So he's living in such a pressure-filled uh, moment and time and he's in this place where he feels like nothing and the angel of the Lord comes up to Gideon and says, you valiant warrior. Who? Yeah, you, you, you valiant warrior. Me? Yeah, you, you, you valiant warrior. Nah, God, you got the wrong one. <laughs> I'm not a valiant warrior. I'm just here farming. I'm just working my nine to five. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get food for my family. I'm, I'm not that valiant warrior. God, why'd you call me that? Valiant warrior. I mean, I like how it sounds. I mean, could it be? Could it be that that's... Nah, nah, probably not, probably not. Can you see the internal battle that Gideon would have been going through? You're calling me this, but I am living a life and what I see is nothing but. He even goes and he, he gives it to God. He's like, God, if you were so good, then why is all this happening? And then he goes on to say, God, I'm, I'm nothing. I am the least in my family. I'm from the last family. I'm from this, I'm from that. You've got the wrong one. But can I just say, and I've preached this before, that he who created us knows how to call things out of us that he put in us. You might not know how to bring out the valiant warrior within. You might not know how to bring out the strength within. But let God lead you into that place. Because you've heard me say this before, the creator has naming rights. Only he can name you. I don't care what your father said about you. I don't care what your mom said about you. I don't care what your family says about you. I don't care what your friends label you. Only your creator can sign off on your name. He has naming rights. Let him name your situation. Let him name your circumstance. Let him name it. Only he has the final say over you. And when he speaks to you, he sees the best in you. And he calls you towards your potential. He calls you towards your gifting and your call and your destiny. So when he says these words, the test is, can you trust that? When he says you are loved, can you believe that? When he says you are enough, can you have the boldness to believe that? I just want to show off my tattoos real quick. So I was in Matthew 16. Oh, I should know the reference of what's marked on my body. Um, Matthew 16, the campfire session, the campfire conversations. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's wondering what I'm asking you today. Can you trust him? He says, okay, we've been walking together for some time now. I've preached on this a thousand times. He said, we've been walking together for a thousand times. Oh, a thousand times. You've seen me heal. You've seen me preach. You've seen me declare who I am. But who do you say that I am? I want to know. We see so many times where the disciples lost to Jesus. How do you lose Jesus? So, so many times where the disciples didn't know who they were speaking to. But I love it because it shows us. But then he's like, okay, I'm going to test these guys. Who do you say I am? Oh, some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're this. Some say you're that. But then Peter, under the power of the Holy Spirit, says, you're Jesus. And it was his confession 
that changed his confession, what he spoke, his confession that changed the course of his life. Doesn't matter what your family confesses about Jesus. Doesn't matter what the world confesses about Jesus or what anyone confesses. What is your confession of Jesus? He says, who do you say that I am? Because that's why I've got this marked here. Who do you say that I am? Because sometimes before I get up to preach, I kind of look down and feeling nervous and scared. Lord, I don't want to stutter. I don't want to feel like you, whatever. Jordan, who do you say that I am? You're my God. You're my strong one. When Peter had the right confession, he then learned about who he was. Jesus looked at Peter and says, ah, now I'm, because, you, because you've seen me, You've found who you're meant to be in me because I am in him, he is in me. We are this grapevine together. And so he says that I am. So when I feel like, God, I'm not enough. No, no, he says I am. He says I am. Your confession changes the course of your life. Before he knew you, Jeremiah 29, 11, before he knew you, he gave you a purpose before, sorry, before, sorry, when you were born, sorry, when you were born in utter seclusion in the womb, he knew you. His presence was all around you. There is this intimate knowing of God for you. And he says, I've got plans to prosper you and not to harm you. I've got a purpose for you. Now, hold on to that thought of how much he knows you. That's why he's able to call things out of you. In Romans, it says, uh, I've predestined my children. And those I have predestined, I have justified and I have loved. But he says, I have called. For us here who are Christian, we have answered that call. When we heard that call, something about that voice said, I know who's speaking to me. Something about that voice said, I, I, I know who's speaking to me and I'm going to give my life to you. Something about it rocked us to our core. We say something, we say things like, oh, I found Jesus at this age or I heard his voice at this age. But the fact is you heard him in the womb. He knew you when you were nothing. He, there was your, his presence was around you. And so now when he calls you at whatever point that was or whatever point that is to come, something about it feels like your father. Something about it feels like home. You can recognize it because it speaks of who you were before you were born. You were with him. So it's because he knows you that he can call things out of you. And because he knows you, he comes up to you and he says, you valiant warrior, get out of this pit. Get out of this wine press. Look at this thought. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. God does surgery on Adam when he's about to make woman. And they're in the dark, in a confusing, perplexing place. He puts Adam to sleep and brings a rib out of Adam and makes woman. Adam didn't know what a rib was until God pulled it out of him. What am I trying to say here? <laughs> God can pull things out of you in certain seasons that you didn't even know you had in you. He can pull things out of you. Valiant warrior that you didn't even know you had in you. But can you be bold enough to listen to his voice? Take what he's saying. And believe it. How are you guys going out there? Good. The real test of maturity is not just to hear his word, which is important, and trust it, but to speak it over yourself. And like David, I know how to encourage myself in the Lord. What this is, is being aware of who you are. This is important because your value is understood and your worth is realized when you know who you are. Lamentation 4.2 says this about you. The precious sons of Zion, worth their weight in fine gold. How they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hand. You are marked with divinity. You've got God's fingerprints all over you. You are worth your weight in fine gold. If you don't know what you have and you don't know who you are, you won't take care of you the way you should. 
you will look at yourself in the mirror and you will cuss yourself out. You will look at yourself in the mirror and you will confess some things that if you were to say anything like that to someone else, they would punch you in the face. You know I'm, I'm speaking truth. The way we talk to ourselves can be pretty disgusting. And it's sad because you know when Jesus says to the Pharisees, gosh, says to the Pharisees, because they're trying to trap him, they say, hey, you know, sh should we pay our taxes to Caesar? Really, they were trying to kill him. And if he said no, they wanted to kill him. But he says, okay, pass me this coin. He takes the coin. He says, whose image is on the coin? They say, oh, well, that belongs to Caesar, right? Because it had the image of Caesar on the coin. And he said, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Okay, what's he saying? Image bears ownership. When you carry the image of God, you belong to him. So when you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're not liking what you see, can I go a bit deeper there and say, <laughs> stop cussing out or spitting on the image of God. Because you are made in his image, you are made in his likeness. You want to see your worth, just look at who you are and how beautifully, wonderfully made you are. You are his. And when we can't look after ourselves by our self-talk, what we're really doing is going much deeper and speaking over the one who gave us life. Image bears ownership. Then we start living a life that says, well, I would have done it differently had I known who I was. I would have, I would have paid more attention if, if I knew who I was. I would have resisted the enemy a little bit harder had I known I was me. When you don't know who you are and what you have, you don't take care of you the way you should. So we need to do what 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says. We need to look in the mirror of God's face. And you will find how beautifully and wonderful and glorious and majestic He is. But I also want you to find who you are. Because it's in Him that you find you. It's in a life with Him that you find your real life. It's in a life and a relationship with Him that you find who you were meant to be. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. But then when we get to heaven, this is talking about, we shall see face to face. We shall see truth. We shall see it in its fullness. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as, as I am fully known. I know this is talking about when we go to heaven, but we can take this principle in life now where we're complexed and we're confused and we're like, God, what do I do? Look to the one who is truth. Don't look to the mirror to, talk, to tell you who you are. Don't look to your friends to tell you who you are. Look to the God who loves you and died for you and who is truth. What he speaks over you, valiant warrior, is truth. He can't speak a lie. He can't speak anything but what is true. So when he says, I've got plans for you, I've got purposes for you, he's not lying. When he's giving you those dreams and visions, he's not fooling you. He can only speak truthful things. So what in it, in our heart, has to be fixed to, to, to stop us from going the other way? I want to give you five quick reasons. Five quick reasons of why he chose you. To combat that thought of, God, you've got the wrong one. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's got the right one. Wake him up. He's got the right one. Don't wake the baby up though. Don't do that. Don't do that. He's called you because he wants to catch the attention of the world. That's point one. Why is that? <laughs> you know your faults, flaws and failures, right? Like you don't have, to, you don't need anyone to tell you that. You just know it. That's why I get so mad at the church and, sorry, and just in general and just Christians in general when they want to judge. Because it's like you don't need to tell someone how bad they are and they need Jesus and turn and burn and all that stuff. It's like, yo, they already know how bad they are. Tell them who they are in Christ. They don't know that. They don't know that they're loved. They don't know that they're chosen. They don't, don't, they don't know that they're so worthy a king would die for them. Tell them that stuff. Oh, it, it mm, makes me mad. It makes me mad. It makes me mad. Right? But he wants to, and this is how he gets the attention of the world, because you know who you are. Take my stuttering. I know that getting up here is a battle for me every single week. It really is. 
But when he speaks through me, I'm like, that was you. So when he does something through you, when he gets a hold of you and works through you, there is this undeniable, irrefutable knowing that was God. So it gets your attention. But then the people around you who know you, they know you too. Your family and friends, oh, they were this and they were that and they were doing this and they were doing that. But then they see God get a hold of you. It's this undeniable, irrefutable knowing, wow, God's hand has touched my life. So on the backdrop of my past, on the backdrop of my mistakes and my failures and my regrets, His glory shines so bright. So He wants to get the attention of the world. How? God can use a man or a woman like me. If he worked through you, he can work through me. If he worked through Paul, who killed Christians, he can work through me. If he worked through King David, who was a man after his own heart, but who killed another man to get to his wife and have an affair, he can use me. Oh, I can keep going. Noah was drunk. Rahab was a prostitute. I mean, we can keep going and going and going. wants to get the attention of the world through you. Paul says, I came to you in weakness and fear. Come as you are. And with much trembling, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. We know that. But what about this part? So that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. So why did he choose me? to get the attention of the world. Why, how? They're going to see God's power through you. Point two, to keep the message simple. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block for the Jews and the foolishness to the Greeks, but it is the very life of those being saved. Paul was a brilliant scholar. He could have, he could have used all of his intellectual cannons to absolutely demolish people but he didn't instead he shared the simple message of Jesus Christ he took this man who was once far off and 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 brought me near to him and now he has filled me with his spirit to go and reveal him and advance his kingdom he spoke a very plain and simple basic message And the Holy Spirit guided his words. And the Holy Spirit will give you power over your words and use you to bring glory to Jesus. Again, showing God can use someone like me. Three, to bring honor to himself. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have his treasure. But we have this treasure in in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from God. Us. It goes on to say this. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. And here is verse 10. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. He brings you to these places where you can't do it in your strength. You don't know how to even do it, but it forces you to rely on Him. And now God's power can work through you and that's what's going to evangelize to the world. And it's going to keep you humble because you know that you couldn't do it in your own strength. That's why he tells Gideon in Judges 7, you've got too many people. They started with 30,000. Then, oh, I'm going to get this wrong. 20,000 walked away. He says, no, you've still got too much. 9,700 walk away. And you're left with 300. Because God wanted to show that it's not going to be on your strength, it's going to be on my power. I want you to see how anointed you are. You know you're anointed when you can do more with less. You know you're anointed when you can do more with less. He says to Gideon, the people with you are too many for for me to give the Midianites into their hand. In other words, God's saying, it's too easy. Lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Point four of why he chose you to prompt reliance upon him and not people. Paul, when doubted for his ministry, just says, look at the fruit of my ministry. And and you you want to know why I'm so confident? Such confidence is this, 
as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. John 15 says we can do nothing without Him. I can do nothing without Him. So the answer to getting through what we're going through is I must remain in Him. And hard situations, wine press moments have a way of bringing me back to Him. And point five, to fill us with His power. When we see the lack in our own lives, it makes us hunger and thirst after Him. It brings us to the one who lacks nothing and has lost no battle, has never tasted defeat. Tough situations make us desperate. And if we RSVP to the invitation of John 4.14 to come and drink of Him, we will never thirst again. And we will then see that streams of living water will flow through us. Therefore, showing us Acts 1.8, that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Now, not to be spiritually fat and say, look at me. It's to go and do something with it. You will be my witnesses in all of Judea, in all of Samaria, to the ends of the earth, when you receive what I want to give you. So what are the five points of why he wants you, why he's got the wrong one, to catch the attention of the world? To keep the message simple, to bring honor to himself, to prompt reliance upon him and not people, and to fill us with his power. And if you need those notes, I can send them to you. Ephesians 3, 8 to 9. Although I am less and the least of all God's people, sounds like what Gideon says back to God. This is Paul speaking. This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles, those who don't know God, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. What's that mystery? That I was once, once far off. <laughs> he paid the price to get me back. I'm in right standing with Him and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can live for Him. Don't be afraid to show your humanity. It's okay to feel like, God, you've got the wrong one. What do you do with that thought? I struggle with that weekly. Heck, probably daily. You got the wrong one. Are you sure, God? I mean, we were in Bloke's place and we were talking about some deep stuff. Everyone was having their turn. And I said, man, sometimes this, this, this role keeps me up at night. You got the wrong one. But what do you do with that? I've given you the tools to combat that. And if you're asleep this morning, go and watch it back because it's going to help you. It's going to get you through. The way I started this sermon is how I want to finish it. You've got the wrong one. I want to kind of flip that on its head. If you're looking to yourself, if you're looking to your spouse, if you're looking to your friends, if you're looking to the world, you've got the wrong one. There is only one who is your Jehovah Jireh, your provider. There is only one who is your Jehovah Rapha, your healer. There is only one who is your Jehovah Shama, <laughs> the one who is near. There is only one who is your El Shaddai, the Almighty One. There is only one who is your Jehovah Nisi, your banner. There is only one who is your El Shalom, your peace. There is only one who is your Jehovah Sidkenu or Makadesh, my righteousness and my holiness. There is only one who is your Jehovah Rohi, your shepherd. His name's Jesus. There's only one. There's only one. You need to look upon this Jesus I speak of daily. Daily. When the music comes on, it just fuels you for, for the end, but it's really to let me preach a little bit more to trick you. Revelation 1. 9 to 18 I'm not going to read the whole thing <laughs> but John is having an incredible experience of seeing Jesus and this is what we need to experience he's having this vision in the spirit 
And in the Spirit, because the Spirit reveals Christ, so the Spirit is showing John this incredible image of Jesus. His hair is, oh, thank you. Thank you, Douglas. His hair is like pure white and his eyes are burning with flames and, and his, his feet are like burnt brass and he's speaking with the voice of, that sounds like thousands of waters and he's having this incredible experience. And this is what he says about looking upon Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though a dead man. The sight of Christ humbles us. It brings us low. The sight of Christ invokes worship. How can you look at that and not tremble and say, I give my life to you? The sight of Christ renders us powerless. You want to shake that self-talk that says you're not good enough, that you, God's got the wrong one. You need to look at Jesus. And your pride needs to take a knee. Your sin needs to take a knee. Those things that are stopping you, that are killing your destiny, need to take a knee. But it comes when you look at the face of Jesus. It comes when you get alone with your God. And say, I'm not leaving here until you change me. I'm not leaving here until I feel that anointing. But John is saying, I looked at him and I just fell to my knees as though a dead man. And that's the goal, isn't it? To die to ourself and come alive in Him. You've done well. We have landed. Didn't know how we were going to land, but we did. God, you were good. You're so good. Some might even think, and it's a little bit of a trap, but you're too good. Because that sort of makes us feel like, ah, oh, no, you're too good. I don't deserve you. No, 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 no. Yeah, this is a free gift that He gives to you. The goodness of God should overwhelm you. The goodness of God should perplex you. The goodness of God should be like, oh my gosh, I just don't get it. That's fine. Just receive it. Just receive it. He's done it all. And so as we take this, and I want to say it again, if there's something in your life, even in your body, that needs to be, needs to come into alignment as you chew on this plastic thing, just think about the body and your faith in what he's done will do something in you. There have been countless of stories, people healed from cancer. I'm, not, I'm not, not lying about that. People healed from cancer just because they believed that, you know what, on the cross, He purchased my healing. We've seen it in our church. I've seen it. And I know I speak that and some people have lost family members to cancer. I have. But He's still healed. There are people that have taken this and they've had pain in their body and it's just left. Not because this has any magic. It tastes disgusting. But it's the faith of what it is. What it represents. Anxiety has gone, depression lifted, suicidal thoughts done and dusted. This is not to be taken lightly. So God, as we take this, we remember your body. We remember that through your stripes, by the lashings, by the beatings, by the whippings, by the thorns in your head, by the nails through your body, we are healed. Take that. It's because His blood was shed that we have what we have. When you see proof of death, blood is involved. So His blood was poured out to show, I'm gone, I'm dead. But at the same time that blood poured out of His side, so did water. What does water represent? Life. His blood purchased new life for you. You can live above the addiction. You can live above the habit. You can live above the thought patterns. You can live above those strongholds because His blood purchased new life for you. Believe it.
Could we just stand? Can we just stand? Can we just have a private moment? Thank you online for tuning in.